them on this glorious Easter morning. I want to share the traditional Easter greeting with you that Christians have greeted one another with for over 2,000 years. I'm going to say, the Lord is risen, and you're going to say it so the Baptists and the Presbyterians up the road can hear it, okay? And the Catholics. The Lord is risen. One more time. The Lord is risen. Amen. Thank you for humoring me with that. I want to tell you a story about a Sunday school teacher and a little girl. The teacher was teaching, trying to teach the class the lesson that Jesus is everywhere. He's present everywhere we go. There, there's nowhere we can go where, where Jesus won't be with us. And that just did not sound right to a little girl in the class. And the teacher could, could see that the little girl was, the wheels were turned in her head. And, and uh, the little girl finally said, well, well, well ma'am, I, I know one place where Jesus isn't. And the teacher smugly replied, oh, really? <laughs> Where is that, young lady? Well, I know he ain't in the grave. <laughs> Amen, right? Uh, please uh, take a few moments and uh, look at the announcements in the bulletin while we're doing that. If you haven't already, please take a moment to register your attendance in the registration pads in uh, the aisles of each, uh, each row. We uh, would, would like to con be in contact with you if, if you're interested in being part of our church family. We'd love to follow up with you. If you make a decision to follow Christ today or trust him as your Lord and Savior, we want to be here for you. So, so please, if you feel comfortable, share your information with us and we'll be happy to follow up. Uh, please note our, our monthly mission in April is the Race Path of, of Community Center. And, um, and with some details about that, we do need to extend sympathy to the family of Diane Scaperta. Uh, we share with her family and, and her loss. Also, if you haven't noticed it outside, uh, we've invited the, the church family to bring fresh cut flowers to place in the living cross, and that ends up being a really nice photo opportunity on your way out of church. So please take advantage of that. If you leave out the, the front main doors of the church, you'll spot the cross over to your left. Please read through our announcements. We have a, a lot going on, and we're very grateful of that. April the 14th, two Sundays from now, is Bring a Friend Sunday. It looks like y'all did that today, so that's great. So everybody come back with a friend on April the 14th. Uh, we have a, a, a nice service prepared and a, and a cookout afterwards. Should be good weather, so come out and, uh, and enjoy Bring a Friend Sunday, April the 14th. Um, there's an announcement about graduating high school and college seniors. Please read through that announcement. Uh, Mr. Buddy Styers, where are you? Would you, would you stand up, Buddy? Would you mind? Uh, Buddy, uh, along with uh, another of our church members, uh, Barry Thickpin. Barry, would you stand up, please? Both of these gentlemen were awarded the Order of the Palmetto in South Carolina recently. It's truly a high honor. There's some details about uh, Buddy's announcement. I think Barry's was in the bulletin a, a few weeks ago, but they were both in my view and wanted to call attention to my, my dear friends. We're, we're so thankful for you and, and proud of your service and leadership in our church and in our state. Uh, please note the, the announcements about our youth group and our children's ministry. And uh, a big thank you to those who served at the community kitchen this past week. That's a wonderful way to serve our community. So uh, thanks to the missions committee and especially to Michelle Bowers for putting that together. Let us briefly now stand and welcome one another as we pass the peace and love of Christ. And to those of you joining us online and on television, we wish you the peace of the Lord as well.
We invite you to turn to him 302. Christ the Lord is risen today. If you would, please remain standing as we, as we recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, I'll invite the children to come forward and share in the children's message with Missy. And uh, also, as those children who are visitors or guests, if they go to Children's Church, we ask that a guardian or an adult join them so we can make sure we have accurate information in case there's something should happen. We want to make sure we can put the right kids with the right people. look great. Do you feel great? Yeah? Everybody in their new clothes and Easter clothes, y'all look fantastic. Well, I'm excited to see you today, and today's a really special day. What is today? Easter. It's Easter. Well, what, what is that? Uh, of course. Oh, yeah? Good. Okay. So, it's Easter. What does that mean? Who knows what that means? Yeah? Eggs, yeah? God rose on this day. Yes, he rose on this day. That's so, that is exactly right. We are, what, what did anyone say? Um, and, the, and the bunny. Uh-huh. Yeah, the bunny did come, yeah. The bunny. That's right. That's right. Well, I'm going to, we're going to talk today about the resurrection. And what that means is Jesus, you know, Jesus came and he lived on the earth and he, to show us how to live. And then he died on the cross for us because he loves us. And then after three days, what happened? He came back. That's right. He came back. And so, did y'all know that we can sell it? We should celebrate Easter every day, not just today, but we should keep celebrating Easter tomorrow and next week. I know that sounds kind of funny, but we get to celebrate that Jesus is alive every day. All right? All right, I want to share a story with you real quick from... Yes. I want to share a story real quick with you about um, a disciple that missed Easter for a whole week. He didn't know. Here, he didn't believe yet, okay? So after Jesus rose from the dead, he went to see his disciples. And in the book of John, it tells us that, that they were all there except for Thomas. All right, and when Jesus came and he showed up to him and he said, look at my hands, this is where the nails were, and look at my side where the spear was, okay? And all the disciples were excited because Jesus was alive. And so they told Thomas, they said, Thomas, Jesus is alive. That's so it, we're, we're so excited our Savior is alive. And you know what Thomas said? He said, I am gonna have to see that for myself. I really need to see Jesus alive, to believe that, all right? So one whole week, a week went by, and then Jesus showed up again, and he said, you know what? Thomas didn't even have to ask. 
Jesus said, come here, Thomas. I, ha- I want to show you my hands and my side because he knew that Thomas was doubting. And so Jesus showed himself to Thomas, and then Thomas believed. All right, so Thomas, he missed Easter for a whole week. And so what I want to encourage us today is for us not to miss Easter. Okay, it's not just about all the things that we've already done today, but it's about Jesus and celebrating that he's alive and that because he lives, we get to know God. All right? We all pray with me? All right. Okay. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus. And thank you that he's alive. Help us to celebrate Easter every day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. If you are going to go to Children's Church, we're going to go out this way. And any parents that, that you're not sure where they're going, you can follow them. <laughs> have been blessed this morning. If we come to this time of prayer, I will remind you that there will be a pause and I will ask for your prayers, petitions, or requests to be lifted to God. He knows what's on your heart already, so we just ask that you keep it to a name or a topic. 
and he'll do the rest. Let us pray. Abba Father, on this day of celebration and rejoicing, let us remember that we are an Easter people. We should be praising your name daily, the remaining 364 days of the year. We cannot even begin to imagine the depth of your love and what it meant to us. Dear Lord, we could sing your praise for millennia and still not come close to the gratitude you deserve. May the joy of this day reside in our hearts so that people will know we are Christians by our love. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? From doubt, fear, and uncertainty of a dark Friday comes an empty tomb of resurrection. Your perfect will prevails and will continue to do so, Lord. Forgive us for our our casual and, and nonchalant way in which we sin, thinking it's no big deal. It was a very big deal to you. Dear Lord, we pray for this church, not just this building, this property, but these believers who come together as a body, Lord. When we leave this place, may we touch the lives of those that surround us. May we have an impact upon our community, our families, and those that are watching us unaware. Dear Lord, pour out your spirit upon this church, upon this community this morning. Give us a boldness. Give us courage to speak to truth and grace. Dear Lord, we have many concerns that weigh upon our hearts whether they're memories of of pain and suffering, loss. We lift them up to you, Lord, that you might address them in your will. How beautiful are the prayers of your saints, Lord. We lift them up to you and we ask that you address them in your perfect will. Because our plans are but folly. Our plans would never have included a resurrection, much less a cross. We're ignorant of what what sins we commit without even thinking. We pray, Lord, that you will shape us and mold us. That we might administer to each other's needs. That we might sense the pain of others. That we might be able to see with your eyes and hear the cries with our own ears, Lord. That we might be your hands and your feet to administer to others. We pray, Lord, that you will rise up a generation who will stand on biblical truth. We pray that these children that that you have given us opportunity to minister to, that we will give them a foundation based in your word that they might face the future in whatever it may hold. We pray, Lord, that you will give us Rest and peace for the weary. We ask all this, your Lord, in your, in your precious name, saying the prayer you taught us long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I'll ask the ushers to come forward receiving a tithes and offer.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us. Please use these tithes and offerings to do your will, to build your kingdom. Take what little is here and make it a great impact for your kingdom. In your blessed name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is number 308, Thine is the Glory. with an Easter quote from Dr. Philip Schaff who said, before we can reason the resurrection out of history, okay, before we can say the, the, the resurrection isn't historical fact, it doesn't mean anything, it's, it's myth, it's, it's legend, before we can reason the resurrection out of history, we must first deal with Paul, <laughs> the apostle, and the other apostles, the New Testament, and Christianity. We, we must reason all of those things out of existence 
if we're going to try to reason the resurrection out of history. We must admit the miracle or frankly confess that we stand before an inexplicable mystery. So for the, the sermon today, I am going to go back and forth between some of the details of Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20, the resurrection accounts in, in three of the Gospels. Each author wrote the same story, but they wrote it uniquely. Some focused on some details, some emphasized certain details, and I just want to weave some of their details together. Mark's Gospel uh, starts the, the resurrection story in chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, very early at sunrise. Who all was able to join us at the sunrise service this morning? It was beautiful. It was beautiful. Probably close to 200 people came and uh, we started early and by the, the time we finished, the, the sun was starting to peak over the ocean and it, it was just fabulous. And it, it takes us back to how early it was that, that the women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went to the tomb with spices to anoint Jesus' body. This is very important contextual clue. They went with spices to anoint Jesus' body. They were going to prepare Jesus' body for, for final burial. They had watched Jesus die, and it broke their hearts. They loved Jesus so much. He, he gave them hope, and he helped them feel close with God, and it was wonderful while it lasted. But now it was over. And they loved Jesus enough that they were going to prepare his body and pay their final respects for his permanent burial. They had high hopes for Jesus. They had seen some wonderful things. Uh, they had hoped that Jesus truly was the promised Messiah. But most likely they were wrong because how could God allow his Messiah to be humiliated and tortured and crucified like that? They were in horror and shock from the brutal beating that Jesus endured and from watching them nail his body to the cross. They watched as the soldier plunged his spear into Jesus' lifeless body and it made no move, proving that Jesus truly was dead. But he seemed so special to these ladies. He, he, he really did seem like he could have been the Messiah. But he died. They had followed Jesus to Jerusalem earlier that week, ready to proclaim himself the Messiah, you know, at the, on Palm Sunday. And now they're following Joseph and Nicodemus to bury Jesus' body. And they watched as the two men hurriedly tried to prepare his body as best they could for burial, but they weren't able to complete the task properly because it was getting late in the day and the Sabbath was about to begin. The Sabbath began at sundown the day before. And the ladies waited for the Sabbath to end and then they went back just as the sun was starting to come up, just, just to give them a little light to spend the proper time preparing his body for burial. Mark writes in chapter 16, on their way to the tomb, they were conversing with one another and asked, who's going to roll that large stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. And Luke, the author Luke um, of, of Luke's gospel, who had thoroughly, thoroughly investigated the details of these events, said that they went inside the tomb and they found it empty and were wondering about what they had seen. So one, one detail I want you to remember, particularly if, if you have trouble believing in the, in the resurrection, one detail to remember is that when Jesus' closest followers looked into the tomb and saw that his body wasn't there, not a single one of them assumed that he had risen from the dead. 
Even though he said he would rise on the third day, none of them believed it had actually happened. Instead, they assumed something different, that, that someone had stolen his body. And so they ran back to the other disciples and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have put him. John writes that the disciples were so skeptical and the women seemed so frantic and emotional, the men didn't believe them because their words seemed like nonsense. What? His body's not there. He was dead. And so if you're someone who would acknowledge that Jesus might have been a historical person, a historical figure, and most scholars admit that Jesus was a historical figure. If you're someone who believed that Jesus may have been historical, but just can't bring yourself to believe in the resurrection, you're in good company. Because Jesus' closest friends felt the same way on the morning that they discovered his body was not in the tomb. None of them assumed that he had risen from the dead. And after the women told the disciples that Jesus' body wasn't in the tomb, Peter and John just couldn't sit there. They, they had to go look for themselves. And so uh, they ran to the tomb and they saw that Jesus' body wasn't there. Peter went into the tomb. And when he saw his body wasn't there, he didn't shout, Hallelujah, he must be risen. He says he just stood there confused. He stood there wondering about these things. The disciples admitted to their own disbelief. They even documented it. They documented their own disbelief. The resurrection is difficult to believe in. Even for the disciples who knew Jesus the best, who saw him walk on water, who saw him heal the sick and the blind and even raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus' closest disciples had actually given up hope that he would rise from the dead like he said he would. So if you're having trouble believing in the resurrection of Jesus, then you're in good company. And the gospel writers uh, report that later on that first Easter Sunday, sometime after they had all gotten together, they, 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 they got into one place and they locked the doors for, the, for fear of the Jews. And they must have been thinking, they, they killed Jesus, we're probably next. We're, we're on their radar. And so they were taking extra precautions. And even uh, with the doors locked, Jesus shows up among them. He appears in a room with the doors locked. Earlier in the day, they assumed that Jesus' body had been stolen, and now he's standing there right in front of them, alive. Luke writes, they were startled and frightened, thinking they had seen a ghost. But he said to them, why are you, are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still not, did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? <laughs> you could have offered me something. Um, and so they, 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 they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. And I always kind of wondered about that. I think he ate it to, to show them he wasn't a ghost. He was back. He was alive. He, he wasn't a figure of their imagination. He wasn't just, uh, you know, they weren't just wishful thinking. He truly was alive. And Andy Stanley, I love, I love listening to the Andy Stanley. Andy Stanley writes, And then Jesus looks at them and says something that would change their lives and result in a movement of faith that would spread to every continent in the world, it would actually result in our being here today. Jesus said to his disciples, you are witnesses of these things. 
your witnesses of these things. You saw me die, you saw them bury me, and here I am alive. You are witnesses of the resurrection of the dead. They were witnesses, Andy Stanley emphasizes, not of a belief, but of an event, of the event that changed the world and launched the church. The, the, the core of our Christian faith is not a belief. It's an event. It's an event. We mark time today by when Jesus Walk the earth. We date every occurrence that we know of in history based on when Jesus walked the earth. He literally changed the world. Amen? Amen. So after the crucifixion, those who were closest to Jesus. We're, we're, we're tempted to think that if Jesus could be arrested and crucified so easily, then he must not be who he claimed to be. That was after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, and particularly after the Holy Spirit came shortly after that at Pentecost, everything changed. They believed because they saw the risen Jesus. They believed because they, they spent time with him after the resurrection for a period of 40 days. And the reason we believe Jesus rose from the dead is their eyewitness testimony because of their bold and courageous actions based on what they saw, not based on what they read, not based on what they were told or what they were taught. They, their bold and courageous, courageous actions were based on what they saw in Jesus. And after that, they were willing to die for the opportunity to share what they had witnessed and experienced in Jesus. And they thought to re enough to record it in documents that we now call Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. The foundation of the Christian faith is not what the disciples believed about Jesus. The foundation of the Christian faith is what they saw and, and experienced in Jesus. An extraordinary event with profound implications for our lives, for our fears, for our hopes and dreams, and for all of eternity. Everything changed for the disciples when they saw Jesus. Take Peter, for example. Peter believed earlier. Jesus asked the disciples, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And that was when he was with Jesus and his other brothers, disciples. But then when, when Jesus was arrested... Peter and the other disciples ran for their lives. And later that evening, when questioned, Peter denied that he even knew Jesus three times. So Peter believed, and, and, and then he was afraid, and he, he claimed not to believe. And then after the resurrection, Jesus blessed Peter, and he believed again. And, and, and after that, instead of running for his life when danger came, Peter walked toward danger in order to have the opportunity to share the good news of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter just could not stop looking for the opportunities to share good news about Jesus. And many believe it was Peter who sat down with Mark to give his account of Jesus' life that has now become known as the Gospel of Mark. Peter also wrote at least two letters that later became part of our New Testament, First and Second Peter. And in one of these letters, Peter was, was thinking back over his life and his experiences with Jesus. And he writes in chapter 1, verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept 
in heaven for you. Peter lived to tell the story of, of Jesus. And he told it even at the risk of being arrested. He told it even at the risk of persecution. He told it even at the risk of death. And later, Peter ended up dying as a martyr for his faith and hope and witness of Jesus Christ. And Andy Stanley makes the point that, that Peter did not doubt God's love and existence because of pain and suffering. When life got hard, Peter didn't doubt Jesus. When life continued to be hard after the resurrection, Peter did not doubt Jesus. Peter saw a lot of suffering. He saw Jesus suffer. He saw his fellow disciples suffer. And he suffered persecution himself. And yet he kept believing. He kept sharing about what he had witnessed and experienced in Jesus. And I know many people today, including myself, sometimes have had trouble believing in God with the existence of evil and suffering in the, in the world. But Peter's faith was not based on a notion that God does not allow bad things to happen to good people. That wasn't the God that Peter had discovered in Jesus Christ. And so we, we, we ask you today, and, and, and if, if, if you have lost faith in God, if you've been tempted to doubt God because of evil in the world or because tragedy has struck you, we want to invite you today to reconsider. Because the, the men and women who knew Jesus the best and believed in him the most saw and experienced pain and suffering and yet they believed and even through the, the, the pain and, and persecution Peter experienced because of his faith in Jesus he wrote in his letter for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors you weren't redeemed with that but with the precious blood of Christ a lamb without blemish or defect. And he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and your hope are in God. Peter wrote, you have been redeemed. You you have been redeemed. He's getting personal with his audience, his readers. You have been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. And it's through him that you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and your hope are in God. Hopefully, God's grace has, has touched you in some way today maybe the holy spirit is is tugging on your heart or your soul you know when 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 we become aware of god's presence and it's hard to miss god's presence with the beautiful music <laughs> that we've had today but when we become aware of god's presence it demands a response when we become aware of god's presence it demands a response and so what response is God calling you to today? Is it to trust in Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Maybe for the first time, maybe, maybe he's calling you to renew your faith in Christ. Maybe he's calling you to rededicate or recommit your, your, your life to Christ. Is, is, is he calling you to let go of a temptation that you've been holding on to for a long time? Maybe you've tried to quit. Maybe, you've, maybe you're feeling guilty about it. Maybe God is, is calling you today. Make a decision. Respond to my presence. Maybe God's calling you to let go of a grudge that you've been holding on to. Something that's kept you prisoner. Something that's robbing your peace. Something that is coming between you and a better relationship with the Lord. 
listening to the promptings of God in your heart is always the best thing that you can do. And friends, if, if, if you've trusted in Jesus as your Savior and Lord for the first time today, or if you've renewed your faith in Him today, I want you to tell somebody before you leave. I, I want you to tell someone that you trust in the Lord, whether it's me or someone else who can follow up with you and encourage you in your relationship with Christ. It's too important to miss this opportunity. It's too important not to share it with somebody who will pray with you and walk with you and encourage you. What response is God calling you to make for the sake of your relationship with him today? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. And so friends, uh, like last week, we're gonna have a closing hymn and then we're gonna, we're gonna have a beautiful postlude. And so after the hymn, we invite you to just keep your seat or, or, or take a seat and, and enjoy this beautiful music. Let, us, let it send us out uh, as, as we continue uh, thinking about and rejoicing over the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And after that beautiful postlude, we'll have our dismissal and benediction.
stand for the benediction and dismissal. I ran across a quote this week, a week about Easter that says, Christmas is the promise, but Easter is the proof. Christmas is the promise, but Easter is the proof. I'd like to add just a little to it. Christmas is the promise. The crucifixion is the gift. Easter the resurrection is the proof, but what is the evidence? The evidence is my faith and your faith, and my actions and your actions. That's the evidence the world needs to see. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you. Go in peace. The Lord is risen.